evening. Welcome to Spiritual But Not Religious. We're glad you've taken your time out tonight to join us. i got a great guest tonight. we got Jeff Brown, the author of Soul Shaping. One of the real, I want to tell you a little bit about Jeff before uh, we get too far into the show. In reading his book, one of the things that I was really impressed with was the fact that what he writes about is from his experience. And so what you're going to hear tonight is the real stuff. It's not some kind of a, of an opinion, some kind of a, a what we'd like it to be, but what it really was. And he's pretty gut level honest from, from what I could see in, in what he's written. And I'm really looking forward to talking with Jeff tonight. In case you're not aware of uh, what we're doing here, spiritual, not religious, and what's the whole idea, there's this huge population now of people who are disconnected from the church who have decided they don't need a middleman to find their way to the God of their understanding. And there really isn't any place or any facilities that are standing in the gap for that. And so spiritual but not religious is, is uh, acting as a temporary voice for that community. You know, when you fill out a form and, uh, and you're asked what your religious preferences are, you're going to get the main religious uh, choices, but the only choice for someone who's spiritual but not religious is other. And so maybe if there's enough of us talking about it and get out there squawking a little bit, maybe we'll find a new genre for spiritual but not religious. The big problem, or not problem, the difficulty with that is that we don't really, we don't form a group. And so we have no, uh, we have no group voice. And so it's, 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 we don't have the community, the same community that's offered by a church. And that may be one of the one of the things that's really lacking for us. But at any rate, uh, we're going to be talking with Jeff. Uh, you, you have Jeff there for us? Uh -huh. And Jeff, how are you? I'm good, George. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Good, good to talk with you tonight. I've been looking forward to this. I've spent quite a bit of time with your book, uh, mostly because it was I found it to be a really interesting read, and you have a, a real way with words, Jeff. I, I just appreciated <laughs> And a good sense of humor too. I, I, I like a lot of what you what you have to say, a and and more importantly for me on a personal level, some of our experiences are so matched up that it was almost eerie for me to be reading your work, and uh, we'll we'll discuss that as we we get in for the night. Uh, let's kind of start out here tonight and let's get some background on you, Jeff. Uh, let's talk about uh, you know like where you came from and what kind of brought you here. Tell us a little bit about your home life. Uh, it, that seemed to have some real bearing on, on where you've come to today. Yeah, I grew up in, uh, I was born in Toronto, and we had a Jewish mother and an Irish father who spent most of their time at war with each other. Uh, but you know, pretty much from the age of two or three, it was a really a complicated house. You know, quite tumultuous, quite changing. Um, and uh, I think some, somewhere around the age of three or four, I really I really got involved. You know, I got uh, my mother had a lot of she projected a lot of her frustrations into marriage and the economic reality onto me. My father was very passive and non-responsive, and, and I was quite a reactive kind of a warrior as a child. And so, really, for, for the most part, for most of the early years of my life, I was in, in battle with both of them, but primarily with my with my mother. And that warrior way of being uh, seemed very natural and organic to me from a very early my adolescent years, I would see a guy in a Netty Green print on television who was a criminal alien branded on Netty Green print Canadian, and I felt a lot of identification and resonance with him. He, he was a he was a warrior to some degree, and I used to say I'm going to work with that guy one day, and I, you know, and I was really living that out in my environment. I mean, I was not defending someone else vicariously; I was defending myself. But this warrior self-defense way of being, this archetypal style, was very familiar to me. And and as things unfolded, I ultimately ended up working with him in criminal law for my apprenticeship here in Canada. And, you know, just before I was about to make the decision to go farther into that path and to sign on the dotted line and become a practicing attorney, I heard a little voice inside of me that called me away from that hostile and adversarial way of being in the direction of a more surrendered path and, um, and then went on a very, very different kind of journey. And, you know, I, uh, it, it took a long time to get this. You know, I, I used to say when I was quite young, I, I distinguished between this term false path and this term true. 
truth to happen. I was so convinced in my early life that this crazy family was false cast, and it took many, many years for me to understand that being born into a, a warrior environment, a hostile environment like that was absolutely essential to my soul's journey in terms of my willingness to ultimately shed that path. Ed, Ed, the, un, uh, the truth path. I want to talk a little bit about some of the personalities that uh, that, that, that you uh, that you talk about in the book that you had taken on, like Hyperboy. Tell us a bit about Hyperboy. Yeah, God bless Hyperboy. You know, yeah. I was uh, you know they put me on Ritalin. I was so hyper in that environment. I was tantruming. I was you know I didn't understand then that what I was doing was trying to discharge the tension. Right. right. And Hyperboy was a wonderful way that now they they have terms for it, like attention deficit disorder. And really, what it was for me was. You know, I was really trying to keep myself activated so I wouldn't have to feel all this pain in the environment that I was in. And right. So I was just always in motion. You know, the faster I moved, the harder it was for them to shoot me. I mean, it was like that, right? I totally understand. I came from that same kind of an environment. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of us did. And I think we pathologize these tendencies without understanding that it's important to look at the source of those issues. You know, where did it come from? Why are we acting in that way? And it's because... You know, then when my environment changed as I got older, I found that I didn't have that tendency so much. Last week I had a, a uh, an author who, who wrote a book, uh, uh, Your Soul's Plan. It mm -hmm. talks about, you know, planning your life before you come in. Uh, and I think there's some, you know, some real validity to, to, to who we pick as uh, parents and the kind of difficulties that we find ourselves in and, you know, but it takes years, doesn't it, to get to the point where you really can look back and understand, hey, there was a reason for this. Well, I think you have to go through those stages of acknowledging that you're a victim. You know, as I say in the book, you have to acknowledge yourself as a victim before you can recognize the choices, the karmic choices that you made to become one. And, you right. know, in the beginning, it was impossible for me. I mean, it was so essential to my process and my coming into myself to be able to say, wait a minute, that was really not okay. And those shamed, mess shaming messages that I've internalized are not really true to who I am and are interfering with my path. And to really write the letters and express the anger can move a lot of that out of me. And that was an essential part of the process. So many people interact with me now who are trying to get to that step of stage of forgiveness and broader perspective before going through the organic stages of expressing their anger, moving through their shame, and really understanding the impact that this messaging had on their inner world and their development. And so, yeah, I spent a whole lot of years just getting in touch with how pissed off I was. Yeah, me, me too. I, yeah. Let me ask you, are you, can you, can you either speak louder or get closer to your, yeah, yeah, because we're having some of the uh, uh, viewers out there aren't able to hear you, and I think I've okay. got you up about as loud as I can. Yeah, I'll I need try to, to be louder. Up. Cool. Yeah. Uh, how about, you know, I was in interested in, I mean, you got about, Three or four of them here I want to talk about, uh, like Encyclopedia Brown. You want to yeah. give us a look? Yeah, Encyclopedia Brown, he's still with me quite often. He, he was uh -huh. my heady self. He was, he was my cerebral self. He was my ability to sort of block my emotions at my neck, put a, move a lot of energy into my mind, surviving by my wits, you know, coping with reality, with my intelligence, finding very tricky maneuvers ways to cope with this crazy environment. My mind uh, was, you know, one of the adaptations and disguises that absolutely allowed me to survive a traumatic and tumultuous environment and allowed me to go out into the world and make a living and build my structures so that I could ultimately do things like write bullshit again, you know? Right. Yeah. It took a long time for me to distinguish um, kind of a no neurotic headiness from a more of a soul source thoughtfulness, you know, and I think for the first many years, there was nothing really soul sourced about it. It was just about survival. For the most so you're part. talking about the difference between intelligence and wisdom? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, probably. Or intelligence and intuition. Or intuition. I mean, I, I have no, you know, it, it's, it's what you're, you're us utilizing your mind to honor your soul scriptures, and you're utilizing your intelligence in that way, then I think it's a fantastic and congruent way of operating, you know? I was split off for a long time, and that split off served me. It was just important for me to recognize when it was time to stop being split off and to try to come back into integration. That integration is qu it's, it's a real journey, and it's, a, yeah. it's, it's difficult. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, how did you deal with the, the integration of the male-female part of you? Were you able to reconcile that? Um, well, you know, I do, I've, I've come to believe that pri primary, really fundamental to my path was 
moving into a more surrender, kind of a white flag warrior sort of being where I still have my edge when I need it, but, you know, it's a more conscious process, and I'm in a more surrendered or benevolently intentioned place. So, right. you know, so much of my work was about, you know, doing even getting body work done very deeply to try to peel away that armor and tendency. And I worked with aloe and bioenergetics to move a lot of anger, you know, that was really preventing me from being in, in a more receptive or surrendered place in my body. And so much of the process for me was about that. I had a love experience I wrote about in Soul Shaper that was really cracked my heart open. And really, I summoned that into my life, I believe, in order to take me to the next place, to a, a more balanced place on the gender bridge where, you know, I was still warrior, but I was a more receptive warrior. And really, that is still so much a big part of my so you talk, as a matter of fact, you talk qu quite a bit about uh, uh, the difficulty with intimacy in that relationship, or at least that's the way I read it, um, uh, and, and really allowing yourself to go in. But before we go there, I want to I I hit on just one other, uh, well actually a couple, three other of your um, personalities, and that is bad boy. You want to tell us a bit? Because I think, I think that, that you know, these are real important aspects of you that, that uh, really you know, bring in the wholeness that you that you become and and what you have to offer. Yeah. And, you know, there are a lot of people out there I think who get caught up in the idea they shouldn't have these different aspects of themselves, and they they get into that shame cycle you talked about. Yeah, and it can be pretty debilitating. So to hear from somebody who's been there, been through that, and come out the other side and found them valuable, I think is is is, is a, a, a really essential for people to hear. Well, you have to honor your parts, you know, and, yeah. and particularly the parts that allow you to survive. You know, now, Bad Boy wasn't, I don't know that Bad Boy was so much an adaptation or a, a way of coping as much as a reflection of the messaging I received. You know. you know, I had internalized, I was really the vilified one, you know, I was the blamed one, I was the, I was the bad boy, you know, I was the right. one who, if I hadn't come along, everything would have been sterling, right? I mean, that was the messaging that I at least got from my parents. I got very different messaging from my grandparents. You know, so I really took in the belief that I was a troublemaker, you know, and so it became a self or soul-fulfilling prophecy. So I was a troublemaker. You know? Right. And even now, you know, to this day, if I'm vilified in a situation where I feel like it's not legitimate, I find my, I get my back up, like I'm still defending the belief that in fact I'm a good person. You know, it, it still startles me on some level to do benevolent work and to find that I'm coming from a clean place in myself because I still hear the echo, the remnants of that internalized message that I'm a bad guy. I, you know, I have the same thing. I, I, we, talk, we, 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 we talk about the same things and have had, I see probably 90% of your experiences parallel my experiences, but we use a little different vernacular. I, I, I kind of talk about the light side and the dark side. And yeah. And, you know, I spent years trying to get rid of the dark in me because I, I knew it was there and I didn't want it. Uh, it took me a long time to realize that it wasn't about getting rid of it because it's like polarity. It's, it's there. To, it's, it really supports the light side. And it was a matter of reconciling that and kind of coming to accept it and put my arm around it and make it a part of me. Just don't live there. But, boy, it, like you were just saying, occasionally it'll come back in at times that I just totally don't expect it. And it's like, whoa. Yeah, I mean, no matter how much work I've done or continue to do on parts of myself, there's still, you know, some of those monsters reappear, and new, new ones reappear. You know, now I'm doing soul shaping, and so, like, I'm, you know, I'm on radio with you. I have this, ex I'm exposed, you know. Yes. And so exposure brings up a whole lot of self-doubt stuff. It brings up a whole lot of fear I have around attack and exposure, and, you know, stuff I've had to deal with throughout my life, but not as intensely as I do right now. I mean, there's a, it's, it's an ongoing, it's just more evidence that this journey just keeps going, you know. Self-doubt may be one of the bigger barriers to really uh, spiritual fulfillment, I think. I agree with that. Yeah, it's yeah. just been a real uh, a real problem in my life. How about Captain America? I love Captain America, <laughs> you know. Um, you know, really, through most of my life, I called the warrior that I identified myself as, as Captain America. Um, uh -huh. I read a lot of comic books. I read Ayn Rand, and I love these kind of heroic figures, you know. And so Captain America was the, the benevolent warrior part of me that I only uh, mildly identified with. I saw myself as a nasty warrior, an edgy warrior, a murderer, a homicidal lunatic, you know, whatever they told me I was. Right. But now and then there would be like this nice guy warrior who would defend kids in the school yard, you know, who would do like acts of kindness, you know, who was really wanting to protect the disenfranchised. And, you know, now I see him a lot more, but I only 
saw him a little bit in the early years and had virtually influenced over time, but yeah, he was kind of a positive symbol or, um, re you know, adaptation, maybe not even so much more a reflection of my ultimate, ultimate archetypal pathway in this lifetime. And, um, but yeah, Did I, 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 I had that, I have a comic book that I wrote, had, had on the wall when I was writing Soul Shaping and it's a picture, and it's something about the mask, and it was really always a symbol for me of who lives below that warrior mask, and where do I really live, and it's really been a theme throughout my life. To go back to that. That's a heck of a journey, trying to get down to the authentic self. You know. Yeah, you, you mentioned attracted uh, everywhere. I, I think I heard you mention Ayn Rand. Yes. Did, did, you, did you get into the selfish, self-centeredness part of that uh, pretty strong, or... No, you know, I, I used to read her, and at first I loved her because I loved that she was, I felt like she was trying to portray some kind of an actualized being. Me too, and, I felt the same way. And vision of actualization, like how Maslow wrote about it, was really what kept me going towards something called the light or something called wholeness. And right. But after a while, I, I saw an interview with her, I think it was with Tom Snyder, and she felt so bereft of emotion, I almost felt as though her movement towards these symbols of actualization were like a disconnect from the unresolved parts, and so I started to feel dissonant about that movement. It felt too, it didn't feel heartfelt or impassioned enough, even though I loved the idea of moving towards a more actualized reality. But interestingly, back then, my idea of actualized reality was this thing called enlightenment, like some blissed out trip. I was there for a, a long time. Yeah, you, it, it's fun for a while yeah. until you fall to the earth with a thud, and but then as I, my journey unfolded, as I was moving deeper into my work and getting more conscious and aware, I felt like I was becoming much more grounded in the reality, the hardships of life as well, it, what I call in realness in the book, really, which is, a, I think, a very different symbol from that Ayn Randian symbol you know, of actualization. Well, yeah, that her, uh, her work is really very, very intellectual. Yeah, and, and 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 I think that just about everything that she teaches is on an intellectual level. Really doesn't yeah. take any of the emotional content yeah. into play at all. It's hard to feel her, and ultimately that's exactly it. It's like if I have a guru symbol in my, and I don't have one, but it, it, it's like an enheartened being. It's someone who right. comes to God through the heart and comes to wholeness through the heart, rather than through just cerebral processes. You know. Yeah. Well, you know, part of the thing is once you start to come into contact with gurus or guru types and you start to realize that they're just humans who have you know had experiences that that we haven't had to that point it changes the, the whole viewpoint on what a guru really is yeah or they have had those experiences but they can present it in a more compelling way absolutely right? you know, absolutely who right. knows that's a whole that's another show <laughs> it's a whole different world isn't it <laughs> <That's a different laughs> world. how about how about the huckster God bless the huckster. You know, these. You know, we got to be. We got to thank our good guys as an adaptation. The huckster is this character, this voice that came out of me when I needed to make a living selling door to door. As a student, I had no money, and I had to pay for everything myself, and had family members to take care of. So I started to door knock uh, at first peepholes, putting peepholes in the front doors of houses with a drill over my shoulder, and then mailboxes and brass numbers and, and stained glass windows and. This voice came out of me like this, like Yiddish Jewish hustler. All of a huh. sudden, he, there he is. He's here with us now, and he allowed me to get through school and, and buy a house. You know, he did so much. He was absolutely, and I don't know where he came from. It, it wasn't modeled to me in my immediate environment. Nobody was like that around me. Is that right? Nobody, nobody. It just came out of me. I found the pattern, and I could never lose it. Yeah, it's quite funny. Well, you know, I think there's there's a, a, a lot to be said for the huckster because when you when you take that ability the huckster has and you focus it on the more spiritual things and into your writing, I think that you know that gives us uh, the huckster is able to, to sell people, and yeah. and and it takes out of writing too because you you know you have these concepts these experiences and and although it sounds a little crass you're still trying to sell your ideas. Well, you know, the huckster is a character. He's, and he's funny, you know. The yeah. Huckster has, like, personality, you know. And I, I like to think he does infuse the writing with a little bit of humor. And that's the, that's the Huckster. That's, that's the sh guy in the shtetl who's like a total character. And you're, you're compelled to him, you know. You, you're, you're buying what he's selling or something. The key for me with soul shaping is to try to present this work in a way that's not a hustle. You know, right. I'm very, very opposed to hype. 
don't like the whole hype either. No. So I'm always a little, even to post on the group, I'm uncomfortable a little. But now that I see that the work is helping people, I'm more compelled to do it. But it's it's complicated. I have to keep them a little bit at bay sometimes. Well, you know, sometimes I think when it comes to our work, it, you know, what 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 might feel like uh, hype to you and I uh, to put it out there is not really hype. You know, it just, it just, we, it, there's a sense of that because we, we want, you know, we want to be authentic. We're not really looking to sell our work quite so much as we are to get people to be able to benefit from the experiences that we've had. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, the language, the, the language at the back of the book has helped me because I think these terms are helpful to upframe and recharacterize the way we understand things. And if people have said back to me that those, that, that language helps them, that, for example, the truth, the term truth aid. Is helpful for them. I'm more inclined to push to move this work out into the world. You know? Right. Yeah. But it's it's how you do it, and it's 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 intentionality. It's 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 a very. I find it a very interesting and complicated dance. You know, and how to present this work to the world in a way that is still keeping me in integrity. Yeah, it's very complicated because the, the uh, false pride and ego can get in the middle of all of that, mm-hmm. and uh, and then you when you lose that authenticity, you lose any real any real possibility of having a positive effect. Sometimes it can be a totally negative effect. Excuse my dog. Uh, so how about, uh, let's talk about, you know, it's not, from, what I, from what I could uh, garner in your book, there's this committee in your head. Uh, one of them being Little Missy. Right. Uh, how about telling us a bit about uh, Little Missy? And, and yeah. Well, really what happened is I was, I guess I was living from these adaptations of this guy, from these aspects of myself. And uh-huh. when I was just about to become a lawyer, this this voice, at first a distant truth, but it became more of a voice and eventually a voice with language. It started to come through me, you know, and it really, I, the warrior that I identified myself as called this voice Little Missy, like insulting her, like she was like a weak feminine and like, you know, she was spewing esoteric things to me, nuanced things to me that really weren't useful for a pragmatic, driven, focused warrior. Right. Little Missy and the warrior that I identified myself as engaged in this dialogue, like my egoic self and my more subtle self engages in these dialogues, and much of the early part of the book are those dialogues put into more articulated language, mostly sensations, mostly just feelings, mostly discomfort when I was about to make the wrong move. I wasn't honoring my authentic self in relationship or career path. And, you know, over the course of my process, I really I identified Little Missy as this uh, guiding angel that was really pulling me towards a path that really had be always lived inside of me. You know, I had glimmers of knowing of everything that's happened that was significant long before they happened. And it was like this entity, which I now understand to really have been internalized, was really moving me towards these particular key markers of significant relationships and learnings in my life. And only really towards the end of the process of writing the book did I feel like really I had integrated Little Missy as part of me. Right. That that when I w- that's what I was talking about the, the integration of the male female. Yeah. Because it, it seemed to me that's really what you were dealing with was that female aspect of yourself. Uh, yeah. Well, y- I mean, it's we call it female. Right. Maybe because we're men. But really, to me, it's part of an anybody's sacred balance, and really it is the ultimate direction for gender and gender, you know, something that's transgender, that's beyond or inclusive of gender. And I feel we're moving in this direction where, you know, the differences between us and the gender pathways are only the most genuine, real differences, and all these other roles and duties and all the rest of these identifications are falling away. And, you know, I think that my journey really was that journey. I was that, you know, that was my Geographical movement right. towards this place where, you know, I can uh, uh, surrender and try to feel, have a more receptive experience without even characterizing it necessarily anymore as more feminine or something. Well, you see, that, that I think is, is an important aspect, and that is the fact that the, the receptiveness. Yeah. And we do characterize that as female. You know, men are more prone to be, you know, stonewall. We just don't, don't want to let anything in. We're not receptive. 
whereas women tend to be m more receptive. And I think that's where the gender part really comes in, is these aspects of ourselves. Absolutely. And, and the held backness of it, really. You know, right. If we see the toxic effects of walking, whether you're male or female, walking through your life without having the capacity to let down emotionally, without being able to be vulnerable, without being able to be receptive. I remember when a cousin of mine who's particularly armored and heady was starting to do therapy, and he said to me one day, he goes, he goes, Jeffrey, I want to, I want to lie down on the couch beside you, and he, and I want to be vulnerable. I mean, he <laughs> didn't even know how to say the word, <laughs> because we're not trained to say we the word. We have no clue. No okay. idea. No clue. No idea. One, one of the things that you, you, you make pretty clear in the book, which I think is, is truly important, if I'm, if we're going to share our journey and hope that it helps someone else in their spiritual journey, is the, how often that. You know, we get all these things that, went by the time we're writing the book, seem crystal clear, but they certainly were everything, anything but crystal clear. Getting there, uh, most of most of when I look at my journey, most of what I understand is in retrospect rather than even in the moment, even yeah, today. It's a hazy path. Yeah, know. very hazy. For path. most of us, and not everyone, I hope, but certainly we do. We have to learn how to befriend haziness and befriend confusion in a very real way if you're going to move towards a know, a more integrated place, place in your life, because, you know, uh, on the simplest level, I really believe that as the soul shapes for the next stage of moving towards wholeness, there is an inherent tension between familiar ways of being, habitual patterns, and the new burgeoning movement, so there's that, on that level, there's some confusion and conflict, and then there's just the internalized messaging about who you are from the world, and self-concept issues, and practical pressures to have a job to take care of this, it's your calling, you need to make money, you need food on the table, and up against this soulful path pushing up against you, I mean, this is the sacred battleground, and it's hazy, and it's bloody, and it's confusing, and you got to get used to that, I think, if you're going to move forward on it. Well, not to mention the fact that if, if, if we're not conforming to that success model, that we're yeah. just not doing something right. Absolutely. Emerson said something that was really profound for me, he said that you have to be willing to walk the the, the quiet uh, shores of your own soul. And, right. you know, a lot of this is, is just, it's a long, I mean, we, we do it in conjunction with others, but there's a lot of this work that's, that's alone. And it, when it comes to knowing what your spiritual path is, what your destiny is, no one can really tell you that. I think only soul, only soul knows the path it's here to walk. I mean, no, absolutely. They, they can give you advice here. They can be practical and helpful. Sure. But nobody... I mean, maybe there are some seers out there like Amma or Neem Karoli Baba who could see some things, but I don't even know if they could see that far ahead of someone else's journey. It's your soul scriptures are so unique and so privately held that you got to get inside and have solitude and really get to know your inner world and clear the emotional debris and practical debris out of the way that we're going to be seeing. There's a lot of steps to the process. And yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's really tempting to hand it over to someone else oh. <laughs> to tell you who you are, but then you're just feeling really frustrated because it's not going to be who you are. Not to, you know, not to, you know, forget about peer pressure, which is huge in this path. You know, there, there comes this time where you have to, you, you have to leave that, uh, that need for approval behind and move forward with what you know is being truth. About 26 or 27 years ago, I made a decision that I would start to live from uh, intuition, from that little inner place down here in my solar plexus that would, would tell me places to go. Okay. It's been kind of a wild path, and, uh, you know, it's like I had, I've had i gotten, I've come to places I never thought that I would come to. You describe it in a, in a really uh, succinct way you say when you talk about being willing to live into question. Right. I, that's huge. That's, you know, our desperate need to know is a real block. Well, that, it, it is, but for a, a world that's a culture that's still vibrating around survival survivalism, you know, things that are tangible, clarified, and direct, and things that are focused are essential. You know, when we do this work, we're pulling away from the culture. Absolutely. Know, we're going so the vibration of the culture is really still very practical and material. You know, basic needs, one step up, maybe like that. You know, very very close to falling apart any minute. We saw that with the recession. With the recession, how quickly things fell apart. So. When you start to do this kind of work and to sort of surrender to, I'd say flake it till you make it, like surrender to confusion.
confusion and actually think it's really fantastic that you're confused because it means it's a sign of growth happening inside of you. But it's like a whole other planet in terms of where it's really the perceiving reality. And you've got to really get surrounded, if you can, by people who are doing this work and cozy up to the idea that confusion is going to be like your best friend for 10 or 15 years. Confusion and surprises. You know, what's interesting, we'll pay... <laughs> We'll pay big money to go to a really good movie that has a surprise ending that's going to trick us. We'll pay big money to go to uh, uh, a uh, amusement park and ride a roller coaster in order to get a thrill. But yet, we, we when it comes to living life, we don't come close to allowing that kind of thing. Uh, where we'll we'll sit with the fear and and, and and we'll sit with the question. And yeah, it's and it's so exciting, George. And oh. You know, the inner roller coaster is where it's at. I mean, it's exciting. You know, when you get into this dance of soul shaping, this dance of self-creation, of shedding an aspect or a way of perceiving reality, having new eyes the next day when you see and feel into things in a totally different way. How fantastic is that? Absolutely fantastic. I want to I want to drop back just a minute because I we kind of brush by this fellow in your life, and I I just I get a sense that he played. M- maybe even more of a role than what what you speak of, and that that's Eddie Greenspan. Yeah. What you know? What what do you what what's she done for your spiritual life? I know the monetary. Yeah, it's so part. odd to imagine that Eddie Greenspan, great criminal trial lawyer, defender of murderers, huh. has been so beneficial to my spiritual life. He was fantastic. He was like my soul papa. You know, right? I felt so comfortable, so familiar, so natural getting into conflict with him it was like I was totally at home with that guy and he gave me a high level murder trial as an artisan student of Malarney Cell uh, which was a high profile murder trial Coptic killed a kid shot him in the head killed him a whole scene where I was a student he gave this he really 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 had faith in me and I stretched my brain to a place I didn't even know you know I didn't know that I could go that far I right. didn't know I could write a hundred and seven whatever page jury address in four days and nights he believed in me and nobody really had my grandparents loved me but they didn't see me they didn't if i had worked at the gas station forever they would have been totally fine with that I and this guy thought i had something that was special in me and he believed in it and then i tried to live up to what he believed in i lived up to some of it at least and that has carried forward for me so when i sit down to write soul shaping i don't know if i'm writing a book like this all of a sudden i believe in myself in ways i never it's interesting how, you know, s- some of the people that we think would play the least role in our spiritual life actually play play real primary roles. Absolutely. And the other thing he did for me, which was so important, is he, you know, I really got with him what trial law. It was like I'd been a trial lawyer so many times before. I walked in a court, it was like it was I'd been there forever. It right. Was nothing. And it was so good for me to also do this trial with him where I didn't sleep for months, but I fell asleep on the highway twice. And to really get to the point after my childhood and whatever my full carryover was life after lifetime where I really felt like, okay, I am sick of this path. I am sick of this warrior life. I see what I'm going to be doing, surviving by my wits in a courtroom forever and ever and ever, and then I'm going to die in a courtroom. I saw it. So he gave me a gift in that direction as well. He, he gave me enough belief in myself that I could do anything, including believing that I could lead law in order to survive. You know, the one thing that happened with me in, in, in the career I had was I I had, you know, gotten a certain modicum of fame and fortune in, in real estate in my in my uh, county down here in Florida. Yeah. And uh, I got terrifically bored with it at some point. And it was it was a it was just a horrible I found myself in a horrible space and I I actually ended up uh, uh, through drugs and alcohol, uh, became a, were actually really a big part of my spiritual path, and I finally had to just get rid of all that in order to uh, survive, and and really find what you call the true path. I think that's it's a uh, that's a it's a it's a huge part of my life is that is getting on that true path. Even today, if if I had if I had a choice between true path and money. I'm, I'm opting for true path because I I, have, I know the emptiness that only m- money can, and I'm not I'm not at all being uh, uh, saying that you know money's bad. That's not my point yeah. it's at all. It depends where money, where that idea of abundance fits in with your true path. You may have been, you see somebody who needed to make a certain amount of money, 
honor your basic needs, know that you're going to be okay, and then now you've gone on to the most subtle question, which is who are you next? You know, a- how are you going to help the world with shows like your show, for example? And that's a fantastic use of this money. You know, to create. One of the things that my guest last week brought out it was is it's not about how much money you get or or in that part of it, but what do you do with the money? And why do you get the money? Yeah, know, absolutely. What's why your motivation? So, so let's let's move on to. Uh, uh, I had a uh, you had a, uh, an experience uh, that was I had a very similar one that kind of was a, a rocket ship into a whole new level for me. Let's talk about Buddha Land a bit and tell her. Let's, but before before we go in there, if you're out there listening and you've got some kind of a question you want to get involved in the conversation, Tom is uh, on our chat room. We'd love to have you. We'll he'll let me know what your question is. We'll bring it in. We'll ask. Uh, uh, Jeff, the question for you, uh, get to be a part of this. Jeff has got uh, some real wisdom here, and uh, I think you, uh, you'd you enjoy getting involved with us. And back to Buddha Land. Yeah, Buddha Land was, um, was actually a Ron Kurtz term from the founder of the Center of Therapy, and I, I had really liked it. I, I, was, I was going to doing these retreats, and I was doing breath work, for example. Uh-huh. And every time I would kind of clear through my localized perception, move emotional debris, old anger, old pain, old grief, kind of empty the vessel, I would expand and immediately open into an experience of worthy consciousness. Right. Everything was one. You know, like I really couldn't distinguish. It was those notions of separation were, were fell away. Duality was revealed for what it is, all of that stuff. And I would really open into this fantastic dimension of, a, I suppose, a more heightened consciousness. My challenge throughout my journey was to try to figure out, because in that space, I really did experience a sense of oneness. I couldn't understand, though, where my path fit into it then. It was like, okay, so here I am in this vast openness, emptiness, completeness, but, but yet I had all these glimmers of knowing inside of me, telling, that I had, telling me I had particular soul scriptures in the heart of this unified dance, like that I still had a place in it. So every time I would go into Buddha land, it was wonderful, but then it was like, okay, so what's my path? Just to be in this vast emptiness all the time? What about right. all my callings and my gifts? What about Eddie Greenspan? What about Sing Ram Dass and going, God, I know that dude, I'm going to connect with him one day. What is all of this part of that? And for me, my journey was about reconciling, and I call it Eastern consciousness now. Conscious Eastern, now. Yeah. Eastern experience of unity with this more Western question around my self-concept, my particular self-pathway in the heart of this unified landscape. And, and, that, and, that, and r- that really, that last part of it, trying to bring these strands together, really has been the most interesting and ongoing uh, challenge for me. Uh, you know, I, I believe, I, you know, I, I recall when, when uh, Mahi Rishi Mahat Yoga came here and he brought meditation, he really has brought meditation to the, to the yeah. West. I'm I'm convinced that this dance we do is about integrating these two east and west meet west and that's right. and we it has to we're come no fools over here you know we're just a little tilted too far in one direction absolutely and so are they and so really absolutely. it's about just ra- bringing it all together and that's why I call it Eastern consciousness yeah. it's like I'm not foolish enough to think one of us has got it all figured out it's no I think I think you really hit it with that that's I do like your little plays on words that you do uh, Eastern and some of these others are they're pretty great. So y- there's one other thing that, that, that I want to hit on that it, it, it seems to me that you're definitely here. You know, I, I heard uh, Teal Harsh de Chardin said that uh, we were uh, spiritual uh, beings immersed in the human experience. And I have spent a lot of time trying to be spiritual, Buddha land, if you will. And, and w- one day it occurred to me that if I already am spiritual, why am I spending so much of my energy trying to become spiritual? And that what I really need to do is focus on being a better human being. That's it. That's spi- spi- what is spirituality other than you know, encompassing all aspects of reality? Yeah. To me, the movement towards spirituality is a movement towards becoming more deeply human. And, and, and in that frame, finding our way to some some semblance of humility and compassion, and, and that may be the that may be the hardest part of the journey for us. You know, we got we have ourselves so differentiated in 
and so uh, so focused on if I'm on if I'm not this, then I'm I don't have value rather than just the innate value of ourselves as, as human beings. Uh, I you you play with words a lot, and one of them is your your human festo. Is that yeah, tell us, human human festo. Will you tell us a little bit about what what you mean by that? Yeah, it, this is on the website. I it was just I was just trying to kind of I, in, instill all of these concepts and ide- uh, concepts and ideas. And now I'm I'm getting better at it. I think, but it's just something that really kind of describes where I was coming from. So there's the manifest of the soul shape, and it's just this belief that everybody comes in with particular and unique soul scriptures that are very real and coded in them, particular gifts, callings, experiences archetypal movements, relational connections that are relevant to a movement in our life and expansion, and that really it's about identifying those soul scriptures and then embodying them in order to move your soul one step closer to wholeness, and, and really just to try to like focus on you know, emphasizing and advocating for others the idea that everybody has them. They really do. You're here for Absolutely. Reason, and it's and it's not just some flaky concept for me. It's really grounded and it's really landed for me in my own body and in my own experience. And, you know, so it's about meeting somebody and making the presumption of that, you know, really believing that there is this soulful being living inside us, below and within, and connected to, but not always connected to, their self-identification. I work with a a lot of people and have worked with a lot of people over the years, and the the biggest thing that I really focus on is is trying to help them to get to that center of their being, that essence, you know, that still small voice within that, when we listen to it, will guide us in, in, in the directions we need to go. Absolutely right. So, so I, we, we share another experience. Mine had a different name, but it certainly catapulted me into a whole new uh, frame of understanding. Let's talk a bit about Rachel, if you will. Yeah, Rachel is uh, in the love chapter. Rachel was a, a woman that I I summoned on a, on a soul level, and, and she summoned me. It was a profound, uncommon bond or soulmate, or somebody might call it twin flame. We were, we, we met each other, we just known each other forever, and in her presence, I was cracked open to that unified field, the field of consciousness and perception, almost instantly. It right. Was, it was radical. I mean, it was really. And at the time, I was still a pretty pragmatic, grounded person. So I found that I was, you know, inherently cynical about these things. You know, I really checked it out, whether it was authentic, and it was authentic. And it was really a gateway to God-love connection experience that, although I didn't know it at the time because I was just trying to manage this profound emotional experience, uh, was really what I needed in order to move forward. You know, the, the experience ultimately proved to be earth-shattering and heartbreaking. And there was a choice point after the connection fell apart where I had choice, and I knew it, between going back to the warrior armor that I knew best, or allowing myself to go into the heart of those feelings, and uh, surrendering in a way that I had never surrendered before, and, and, you know, I resisted it and went through a whole process, and then ultimately at Heart of Hearts, there was like, my soul made a decision to open to it, and really I think through the heart of that opening, my soul shape into the book was born, you know, I think if I had stayed armored and closed off, I saw that that was just going to sustain itself really for people and for me to take in my life. Yeah, I'm convinced you would not have been able to write the book in with the depth that you wrote it yeah. without that experience. And, and that, you know, for, for me, I had a similar thing. It was, you, you talked about uh, how the sexual encounters that you had with one another, the, the heights that they were and the wonderfulness of it, and yet on the other end of that was the arguing and the difficulties you had one with other and I had that same kind of experience and it was like heated on both ends. Well you know it's like you know great they say great love uncovers everything unlike itself. And huh. When you open that door you, you know I I don't have to say that. I can say that. I wish I'd said that. But That's a great saying, yeah. But it's true, you know and sure. I think what happens when you open the gateway to the heart at this stage of the collective unconscious and when you open it as deeply as that kind of a love connection does, you're immediately confronted with all the toxicity and negativity and fear around vulnerability that that most humans have. I mean, these associations are familiar to all of us, and, you know, there's no one there to help support that kind of a connection. The culture isn't vibrating. It's so subtle, that kind of connection, you know, and so ultimately it starts to turn against itself, you know. So 
But whenever you, on an individual level in this lifetime, forget all the symbolic, soulful stuff, like just what have you been through with your mother and your father comes up, and it comes up so intensely. And I remember having an experience with her when, you know, we were going to get married, and I remember feeling so completely open. And I was older than her and a little more solid in terms of being able to hold that door open once I got it open, I think. Right. But even then I thought, I don't It feels dangerous. Absolutely terrible. Yeah. I'm too vulnerable. I'm not in a protective enough state. My not hypervigilant. My eye isn't on the door to see who's coming in with a weapon. You know, all that stuff comes up like you feel so completely open and unshielded. And yeah, that's tough. Well, you, you know, there's, I don't know who said this, but the, the pain is the touchstone to spirituality. And, and I think, unfortunately, there's a lot of truth to that. At this stage of the collective unconscious, we I yeah. hope and believe ultimately we'll reach a stage where, where, where joy is much more of a touchstone of humor. But I well, think at this stage we can give it a whole lot of attention. Well, I think I think once you once you at least my experience was is that once, uh, you know, once I moved through some of these painful experiences, what what happened uh, for me was I I'm pulled now as much by the joy as I was pushed by the pain. Where I, you know, where I, I I'm willing to to do uh, more of that inner work because it just seems to be a never-ending process in my world. Uh, because I know there there's a you know there's joy at the at the end of that in in, the, in that opening, although it is it does feel really dangerous. No question about that. Well, there's joy, but you know, for me, what I what I love about it, you know, when I really go into this process deeply, is I don't know, you know, sometimes I definitely feel better afterwards. Like if I see the negative emotion. Yes. You know, what I, I say call cellular soul and the book too, where I always say repressed emotions are not actually our spiritual essence. So right. you see the feelings all the way through. There is some growth and expansion in it. But for me, it's not always joyous. Sometimes it's just that I just feel more genuine. I just feel more really here or something because I'm not hiding behind something or holding in some part of my emotional body that's obstructing my perception of the moment. And I don't always feel good, but I feel present. Well, you know, uh, I've, I've read quite a bit of uh, Jung, Carl Jung's work, and you know, he was a mystic. Uh, as a matter of fact, he bought a, bought a mystic tract from the uh, uh, Nag Hammadi collection, and uh, I, I think he even wrote an, uh, a uh, a mystical tract under a pen, a pseudonym. Uh, but he, what you know, all of his work, everything that he did really came down, you could distill it into finding our way to being authentic, being who we really are. That's it. That's all. That's all of it. You know, I call it in realness. Just be real now. I mean, that, that alone is so complicated and challenging. And to me, that's it. It's just about shedding, you know, misidentifications, internalized negative messaging, you know, the weight of the world, the messaging of the world, all that stuff, just to get down to the bare bones of who we really are. What path are you here to walk? What gifts and callings are encoded in you, however humble they may be? You know, how fantastic is that if you can, at the end of this lifetime, come to a place where you feel completely at peace with who you are in your own soul skin? That is the greatest achievement on earth. It's huge. Unfortunately, it's taken me uh, to get any semblance of that. Uh, I've had to get older uh, by quite a bit in order to catch that. It'd be on some level, I, I think it would have been nice to have gotten that earlier. You and I have another experience that... George, if I may say, dude, you yeah. are so far along the path compared to most men on this planet. you got to give yourself a pat on the back. Well, well uh, yes, I th th thank you. It would you. have been nice if it happened at 14, but here we are. And it but it is what it is, right? Spot, yeah. But in the sequence. Well, you know, I, there, there came a point in my life where I really realized that, you know, it was like... I could say, well, why didn't you know that earlier? But the truth was, God, you know it now. Uh, isn't that great? So I'm, I'm sure with you on that end of it. Uh, September 11th, uh, 2001, uh, was a, a huge turning point for me, very much like yours. Yeah. I came through it in, in, uh, in the February or March. I actually... Uh, 
started writing my book, uh, Mastering the Light, and you had a similar experience. You want to tell us a little bit about about it? I had, I had just read, started writing Soul Shaping, and I had come back from Harvard Hall Springs, and I was, my heart was as wide open as it had probably ever been in my life. And then 9-11 happened, and I found myself going immediately back to a warrior adaptation. Uh -huh. I was ready to hunt bin Laden. I was, you know, driving to the streets of Toronto, hypervigilant, waiting for the next attack. I mean, I, my warrior came right back to the fore. I was surviving by my wits and really mocking the part of me that had wanted to write this book. You it's know, interesting how we do that, isn't it? What an, what an impractical thing to do huh. when the world's at war, dude. Right. You know? And it was a struggle to get back to this place where I could sit down with this book and continue to believe that I was doing something helpful and useful. And you know, one term that I have in the dictionary, which I don't talk about enough, is this term conscious armoring. And I, you know, I, th that came through me more around that time when I realized that I wanted to become aware that sometimes it was necessary in this world to put my armor on and adapt, get into my persona, do what I had to do. But, you know, it was also important to be able to recognize when it was time to stop. Right. And that I didn't need to armor anymore, and that it was okay to come back into my heart. And at this stage, the collective unconscious in terms of where we're at in our awareness, I think it's an important thing for people to start thinking about. It's unrealistic to say you're going to open your heart at this stage in the world and, and be there all the time. But that's very difficult if you're in the urban world, for example. But to notice when you can take off that armor and be a little softer and more subtle is, I think, a really important step. Softening has been a real a huge part of... Um, uh, it's been difficult for me, and that... That, that, you know, it's uh, like you say, a lot of this is so habitual. What's, what's interesting to me is I believe that, not only believe, but I, I'm quite sure that a lot, of, a lot of what we do in the way of becoming the warrior to make m money yeah. probably isn't really even necessary. Uh, like we go too far. Way too far. And yeah. just being authentic and have... You know, I think the real key is for whatever I'm doing is what's my motive? Wh why am I doing? You know, we, and for every act that we do, I'm convinced that we have at least two two motives, Jeff. You know, we've got that altruistic motive, the one I want to believe about me, and the one I want you to believe about me. But always, there's always that self-centered motive that's down underneath all of that. Well, so and self-centered, you know, it, 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 to connote something negative, it isn't always that. Not you know, at all. It's just fear-driven. Yeah, d absolutely. It's just fear driven. You know, I, I think we come from fear and survivalism so much more than we recognize, even in Western culture, which is so wealthy in many parts of it for many of us. We still carry that echo from generations before parents or grandparents who, you know, they had barely had enough food on the table. You know, most people I know have parents who had that experience at one time or another. And, you know, fear motivates so much of us in terms of not wanting to go back to that reality ways that we don't even recognize or realize, and often completely irrational and unrealistic. I can't tell you how many people I've known, elderly people, who live in North Toronto, lots of money, who are still racing off to the grocery store with coupons to save 15 cents. <laughs> Wealthy as can be, but yeah. they, don't, they don't know it. Their mind knows it, but their emotional body is still back there. Well, I'm convinced that security exists only in the mind and nowhere else. You know, it's like if, if I'm not secure in my mind, I'm sure not going to find security out there in the world somewhere. Uh, by, by the way, for our viewers' sake, we had planned uh, that Jeff would be on video. You see Tom up there in the corner, and I'm able to actually expand that full screen. I was looking forward to uh, uh, Jeff, but he had some technical difficulties with, uh, with his camera, with his equipment, and... Uh, Tom and I are pretty familiar with uh, with technical difficulties here with what we're doing, so that's the reason you're not able to uh, to see uh, uh, Jeff tonight on on camera. So we we missed that part of it. Listen, Jeff, we only got uh, you know three or four minutes left here, and I don't want to leave without without checking with you to see if there's something you just would really like to to leave our audience with tonight uh, uh, that that hasn't been said or something you want to reiterate? You know, I just I come back to, the, it's like my mantra now, which is to encourage people in realistic terms just to create a small amount of space in their lives each week to spend time with this little voice inside. If they don't have that, haven't identified that voice, just to spend some time trying to get connected to one, you know. Like really just 
then having some solitude in their lives, creating a little bit of a boundary around their daily life, at least once or twice a week, so they can get to know the authentic self that's living inside. And not many people are living from their authentic self in various ways, but I, you know, I encounter a lot of people through emails who really feel like they really have no clue, and they're really feeling disconnected from that. And I think it really begins with prioritizing it and having a little faith that there's something inside worth striving towards and creating space for it. Well, you know, I think one of the big difficulties in for people doing that, you expressed pretty well uh, in, in the way you laid out the different characters of Hyperboy and <coughs> excuse me, Bad Boy and Encyclopedia Man. Uh, you know, we, we do have a cast of characters who live in our head. Uh, and there's, you know, yeah. there's several, and we all do. We don't want to talk about it openly you, you, under normal circumstances. And so we don't even know that. We think we're unique with that, and we're afraid. Uh, and so trying to sort those voices out and right. get down to that little small voice, that's a, it's a real job. Well, you know, y you can start with just trying to write down, name the parts of yourself, you know. Even if you don't call them voices, just aspects of, right. you know, personas that you operate from, the sales persona, the nice girl persona, the, you know, whatever, the heady self, whatever. And then ask this question once you've gotten a little clearer on naming the parts, which is, which ones are adaptations or disguises, parts that you have developed in order to survive this crazy world, and which ones, if any, actually feel connected to your authentic self? I mean, that was the core question that I asked myself throughout my processes, which is, which one's the real me, and which one's just a part of me that I utilize to survive? I think there's one, one last thing that may, we might throw out there, Jeff, that you brought out pretty clearly in your book, and that is that when you get in touch with that voice, that still small voice that will take you to your destiny to live your purpose or whatever purpose you came here to live, we have a tendency to, to not trust that voice. Yeah. And because we're listening to to the external world, and, and I would suggest follow it. The worst that can happen is you make a mistake, and you've made many throughout your life. Looks like we're out of time, Jeff. I've, I've totally enjoyed this. We could talk another hour or two, I'm sure. We uh, could. I hope that someone in the audience got as much out of this conversation as I have, Me too. and I look forward to having you back at some point in the future. And That'd be great. Thanks great. for your courageous work, George. Well, good night, Jeff, and thanks for thanks for joining us. You got it. Bye bye. Well, thank you for uh, uh, for joining us uh, here at uh, Spiritual but Not Religious. Uh, uh, hope you can come back. Join us next week. We got an, a great guest. I don't have time to talk too much about it, but I'll be posting it up on the web and. We'll do a little video promo that will be there for them. And uh, we'll look forward to, uh, to seeing you again next week. Thanks again for joining us.